Welcome to the Oxford Martin School and uh, to this lecture this evening by Paul Clark. Yesterday we had the um, budget from the government which is clearly very excited about research and innovation, um, about infrastructure, and then layered on top of all of that, we have the coronavirus um, sweeping around the world. So, um, uh, given all of those things going on, to have a, a, a tech guru of the genre which um, Dominic Cummings would obviously get very excited about, um, and someone who knows more about logistics and how to keep food on supermarket shelves and showing up to people's houses um, seems to be extremely timely. So it's great to have Paul Clark here this evening. Um, Paul is, is responsible for an incredible operation. There are 1,900 engineers uh, in Ocado, um, and not only is that transforming retailing, but it's also doing its best to shake up um, and bust incumbents and disrupt all sorts of other sectors. Um, originally, Paul read physics at St. John's here. Uh, he was the uh, tutee of Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith, who's in the audience, um, and then went on to uh, do a variety of, of different um, uh, software engineering, tech startups, and consultancy roles, um, and has become an increasingly um, a visible and influential figure in the, the whole field of uh, of, of tech and, and logistics. Um, he's on the government's AI Council, on the Robotics um, Growth Partnership, he's chair of the CBI's Innovation Council, um, and he's on the National Food Strategy Advisory Board. But the, the other th remarkable thing about Paul is that uh, he's a, a hands-on guy. Um, the first apps which were created at Ocado, he, he jointly wrote. Um, he lists as his pastime um, designing circuit boards, um, and he, he continues to, to write software as well as doing uh, all of the other things that you've just heard about. So it's a great pleasure to have you here this evening, Paul, in the Oxford Martin School. Thank you, Jim. So I'll just get uh, vaguely set up here. So yes, um, it's definitely raised the stakes for me to have my uh, ex-tutor here. Uh, that was definitely not something I was expecting. But uh, anyway, delighted. But uh, it's, uh, it takes very little to get me back to Oxford. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to be here. And uh, oh, no, no, Siri, go away. Um, so um, the... Uh, uh, robots are taking over. Yes, um, uh, I can't really complain about that. All right, so I'm, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it says here, our recipes for um, exploring um, the transformation of food, but I'm definitely going to stray off onto some other big topics too um, that uh, are increasingly what I spend my time on because um, uh, I, I'm no longer involved in the operational side of the business, as I'll explain. Um, I'm off much more onto the futures kind of stuff. So I want to start um, by talking about um, the kind of the global context that really uh, underpins why we need to do significant transformation um, when it comes to food production. And um, of course, uh, we have to start uh, with um, uh, climate change, uh, which is now irre irrevocably bolted into the world's zeitgeist. And um, obviously, food production uh, is at the heart of many of the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. Um, but, of course, the world population is continuing to grow, uh, and there are many more mouths to feed, and, and unfortunately, in regions where food is most scarce. And uh, we have to also be mindful of the fact that the, the un unintended sort of consequences, if you like, of agriculture um, is having on the environment, whether it be greenhouse gases or biodiversity, soil erosion and flooding, uh, the kind of stuff that Jim worries about um, uh, and tries to solve, um, is becoming increasingly well understood. And depending on who you want to listen to, um, you know, these are problems that we either uh, need to solve by 2050 in terms of net zero or perhaps 2030 or maybe um, uh, some other date. 
Um, and in, the, in our kind of post-Brexit world that we now live in, um, uh, the, the implications for food security, food prices, uh, food import tariffs and food standards uh, are upon us. And that's, of course, before the crisis that we're now living through, where food security couldn't be even, you know, it's, it's been elevated to another whole level. And um, uh, we find ourselves at Ocado slightly in the middle of that uh, game in terms of how will people who can't leave their homes get their food. Um, and there's a growing demand uh, from, from consumers um, to understand where their food comes from and indeed to reduce uh, the food miles to get it to them. Um, there's a growing focus um, on food packaging and food waste, whether it be from regulators, suppliers, retailers, or the consumers themselves. And the NHS is shifting its focus from treatment to prevention. Uh, food has a significant part to play in our general health and well-being, as we know, and um, we've seen the impact of things like the sugar tax on products that the FMCGs manufacture and on consumer behaviour. Um, and as one of the many things, unfortunately, I can say this now, that my mother used to say to me as a child that I dismissed at the time um, as complete nonsense, but which of course turned out to be true, uh, you are what you eat. Um, and um, so she was a little bit ahead of her time on that one. Um, so what are um, the challenges we face in responding uh, to these issues? Well, food is a complex, a properly complex um, uh, interconnected ecosystem with lots and lots of moving parts, not all of which we fully understand yet. And we need to be careful where and how we squeeze that toothpaste tube because there are real risks um, of all sorts of unintended consequences as we try to optimize different parts uh, of that system. And, and we have to face the fact that um, it's going to be very hard to transform traditional agriculture uh, in terms of the impact that it has on, on the environment. Um, the effects of climate change are likely uh, to place more and more pressures on conventional agriculture in terms of more extreme weather events, flooding, drought, storms, and so on. And furthermore, traditional agriculture is, frankly, very inefficient at turning uh, photons um, from the sun into calories and protein, as we know. Uh, and that we then want to consume. And um, if any of you haven't come across it, I strongly recommend this blog site by Professor Sir Ian Boyd, who was previously the CSA at um, DEFRA, the Chief Scientific Advisor, and he's one of um, uh, the UK's uh, leading climate scientists. Um, and in his tw September 2019 blog post that you'll find on there, Securing the Food uh, of the Future, he shares three really interesting facts or statistics that to meet both demand and net zero targets, efficiency in traditional agriculture needs to increase by a factor of five to 10 times by 2050. So that's a 500% to 1,000% increase as compared with the current trend of efficiency gains, which is typically a few percent each year. And then if you consider a plant that is subsequently eaten by an animal uh, that we then eat, of the sun's energy landing on that plant, only one to two parts per 10,000 will actually be converted into calories within the animal meat. And finally, roughly 80% of UK agricultural output is produced by 20% of farmers on 50% of the land. And that means that about half of the UK's agricultural land has very low food productivity. And um, so if we start talking about, if you like, the system that gets the food to us, um, there's already a lot of food that is shipped to us uh, from uh, far away, as we know. Um, and here we've listed uh, just some of it. And it comes in these huge kind of um, containers or, or reefers. And uh, one of the challenges is there are increasingly competing demands from consumers. On the one hand, they want variety and availability, but without seasonality. But on the other hand, um, uh, they don't want to think that they're in any way contributing to any of these factors. I'm not going to read through them. You can read them there. Um, and, and that, of course, means that globalization of food production is somewhat at odds with current consumer trends. So we're going to need some alternative recipes, if you like, for food production. We're going to need to find more efficient ways to convert photons into calories and protein. We're going to need to minimize those in unintended consequences of food production and consumption on the environment. We're going to need to view the world food production machine as a closed holistic ecosystem and work out how the UK's food production machine sits within that. As part of that holistic ecosystem, we need to consider things like how do we move food around and keep it fresh, including issues such as food miles, waste, packaging, and circular economy models. 
How can we better educate consumers and transform their behaviours, including issues such as quality versus quantity of food, alternative sources of protein, waste, incentives and packaging? How do we change our relationship with food, its impact on our health, including issues such as food as medicine, personalization of food, obesity, and treatment versus wellness? We need to build a holistic, validated, and fully costed model of our existing food system, uh, food production system, both to help us then optimize it, but also so that we can do like-for-like -like comparisons with alternative food production models. Of course, we need to continue to look for ways to use science, technology, and automation to help transform traditional agriculture um, in terms of its efficiency and impact on the environment, whilst being mindful of those limitations that uh, Professor Inboy talks about. But at the same time, we need to explore new forms of farming that offer the possibility of delivering the efficiency and sustainable ga sustainability gains that we require to meet those net zero targets, including technologies such as vertical farming, insect protein, aquaculture, algae production, and, and others. And we need to move food production from an agricultural process to a manufacturing process with improved sustainability whilst preserving or hopefully improving factors such as quality and nutrition. And all of this is, um, is very much at the heart of the national food strategy that's under development. So before I talk about some of the possible recipes uh, that we're engaged in around food production, I want to talk, introduce you to some of the disruptive ingredients, if you like, that we cook with at Ocado. So um, as has been said already by Jim, Ocado is a world leader in smart logistics. I used to introduce Ocado as the world's largest online-only grocery business, but we aren't that anymore. We still own 50% of one of those. Um, it's uh, the other half being owned by Marks and Spencers. But that, so as of last year, we've divested that into a joint venture. But what that means is that it's left what was always there, um, which is this technology company at our core. Um, or in fact, that's not our core, but we'll get to that. Um, so um, our founding vision was to use a huge amount of technology and automation to do online grocery scalably, sustainably, and profitably, and we've done that. Um, and uh, it was also part of that vision that once we had evolved a solution for ourselves, that we would make it available to other retailers around the world, and we're busy doing that at the moment with our platforms. Um, and at the center of our business model are these huge automated warehouses. They're the largest and most sophisticated of their kind in the world. And as a disruptor, you know, we, there was no template for them. Uh, we had to build them from scratch. We had to create much of the underlying technology ourselves. We've always written all the software ourselves, uh, often throwing away the software that came with that hardware. Uh, and uh, then more recently, oh, sorry, and then buying in the hardware, uh, often stealing it from all sorts of different industries and adapting it for purposes for which it was never intended. But then more recently, we've started to build the hardware too, including the swarms of thousands of robots that now assemble our customers' orders. And the way to think about this, if you haven't seen it before, I'm sure many of you have, is think of it like a giant chessboard. And on that chessboard, um, there are robots that, a bit like rooks, can move along rows and columns. And under every chess square is a stack of storage bins containing groceries up to 21 bins deep. And the robots, they can stop on a square they lower a kind of a grab, a bit like a fairground grab, but one actually picks something up, and they latch onto the top of bin in the stack, and they bring it up into the body of the robot, and then they can move to another square and drop it off. And if that's all they could do, they'd get very bored and frustrated. So they can also bring those bins of cucumbers or sausages, whatever it is, to um, a pick station where uh, a robot or another, sorry, a human or another kind of robot picks groceries from a bin into a customer order or to uh, decant stations where products that are coming in from suppliers on pallets are decanted into the bins and then the robots put them away in the grid. And we call these hives, and uh, in our second generation warehouses, there are typically two of them, one for ambient products and one for chilled products. Uh, frozen products we do in a different way at the moment. And the robots, they collaborate with one another. I um, have to be really careful if there are software engineers in the room because it's not what... Um, uh, software engineers call uh, collaboration because it's not, they don't talk to each other. There is a hive mind that kind of runs the whole process and, and orchestrates the robots. And, but, but that pseudo-collaborative behavior um, means that um, we can pick a typical 50-item order in about five minutes. And that's really, really important given that there is this recipe for immediacy that's going on where everybody wants their order you know, within um, hours or minutes uh, rather than days. And um, if, if a robot, say, wants to get to a bin that's fourth down in the stack, it just gets three of its friends to move the top three bins out of the way, and then it grabs the one that it wants. 
And in our latest warehouse to use this technology, which is in southeast London, um, it, which went live in June 2018, each of these grids is about the size of three football pitches. Um, and uh, when it's fully ramped up, it's not at the moment, we're kind of toning up the dial at the moment, it'll have about 3,500 robots roaming around on top of those grids. And more in interestingly, we've got to build 30 of these warehouses around the world over the next three years uh, uh, for our Ocado Smart Platform customers, and that's if we don't sign any more deals, which we certainly intend to do. Um, so the holy grail, though, of, on, of robotics in online grocery is actually the picking and the packing of the customer orders. And that means for us picking 55,000 different products um, with multiple different form factors and packing them in the correct sequence and in the correct 3D orientation into carrier bags. Um, so it's unlike welding you know, the chassis of a, of a car on a production line or spray painting it, um, for us it's very much about making smart decisions on the fly um, and dealing with the unpredictable. Uh, so it's all about the kind of the grippers, the machine learning and the vision systems rather than the robotics. And one of the many robotics research projects that uh, we have, are engaged in is about developing these next generation grippers. This was a Horizon 2021 called SOMA, which finished uh, earlier, sometime last year. Um, and it's about building grippers that have capabilities similar to human hands. Um, and whether you know it or not, you know, since you were babies, you've been uh, learning strategies for how to pick stuff up as part of learning how to interact with the world around you. And if you were going to pick up a, uh, I've got a wine bottle here, but if you were going to pick up a wine bottle and put it into a wine rack, you know, you, you would instinctively grab it by the neck because you know that if you grabbed it halfway down, your, um, uh, your hand would be in the way. I mean, maybe you weren't doing this as babies, but, uh, but the point is you, you would also automatically, you know, cantilever it by putting perhaps two fingers under the neck because you know that to turn it through 90 degrees, you're going to have to support it. Now, nobody taught you how to do that. You know, you either learnt by observing your parents doing it, maybe, um, uh, as part of your misspent youth, but or you, um, you experimented uh, and came up with that strategy yourself. But, of course, robots have no idea about those strategies. So they have to either be taught how to do it using learning by demonstration, or, which is one of the basket of, of technologies in the AI family, uh, or you, they have to be given the chance to learn those strategies themselves, either in living labs, which I'll come and talk about, or um, using simulation, um, uh, simulated models, if you like, of that physical environment. But what they don't have time is to learn the strategies on the fly when they're actually picking a real order, because that would take too long. So they have to sort of acquire them in advance and put them on the shelf, and then when they're faced with a particular situation, they kind of go, oh, I need strategy number 37. And they take it off the shelf and they apply it to the particular problem that's in front of them. One of our other Horizon 2020 funded projects uh, is, um, that's still ongoing, finishes soon, is about building a humanoid maintenance robot. Um, and uh, uh, that's not taught what to do, but learns by observing human engineers that work and then uses inference to work out how to collaborate with them on their tasks. And uh, uh, we've been gently torturing um, this robot in one of our labs um, in Hatfield to see what it can do, a bit like kind of subjecting it to DARPA type challenges. And, and the reason why we want to build robots like that is, is, of course, what we learn along the way, which is transferable. But it's also the fact that we're going to build so many of these warehouses around the world that automating their maintenance is important to us, but also ultimately automating their construction too. Um, next ingredient is, of course, AI and machine learning. And, you know, AI lets you do the really exciting things with other disruptive technologies. You know, without AI, a robot is arguably just a pile of electromechanical exponents. And it is the smart glue in the Industry 4.0 family of, 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 if you like, component technologies. It can discover or at least unearth knowledge that's been hidden to humans because of factors such as complexity and bias. But most importantly, it's a recursive technology. Shush. Sorry. Um, uh, you can use one generation of AI to help train the next more advanced one. And that means that if you can call it an intelligence, and I think we have to be very careful about that, but um, it will certainly uh, evolve its version of intelligence faster than human intelligence. So when it comes to disruptive technologies, in our terms, it is, in the Tolkien sense, uh, the one to rule them all, at least until quantum computing comes along and knocks it off that perch. But uh, and applications of AI and machine learning, they completely pervade our our platform. So things like uh, natural language processing, you know, customers placing orders with voice and allowing people to talk to robots and things like that, image recognition, smart machines that we build, that route, uh, optimizing the routes that our vans drive on a daily basis, 
providing monitoring and oversight across the platform many more. And we're on this kind of slightly crazy journey, if you like, to build an Ocado brain. Uh, so a general AI that understands our business model, that understands our data taxonomies, that has oversight of our end-to-end -end platform. Um, an AI that can answer questions about the business, that can help us work more efficiently and make less mistakes, that can act like the third gyro on an aircraft, spotting the onset of problems that are about to impact us, that can help coordinate our suppliers, and that can help our customers shop faster um, with less friction and greater delight. But obviously, for many of you in the room will know, that kind of general AI is completely beyond the current state of the art. So what we're really doing is focusing on building, if you like, the individual pieces of that puzzle, the individual neurons of that brain, and then we'll join them up over time as AI technologies and computing power continue to advance. And, and we're really not so fussed on the current outcomes. They're great. What we're really fussed about is the learnings and the competencies that uh, we will acquire along what is now firmly for us an AI and robotics first journey. And the next um, ingredient is the digital twin. Um, now, I'm going to explain what digital twins are in a second, for anyone who doesn't know, but for me, they are the Cinderella of this disruptive family of technologies uh, because they're often overlooked, but with AI and robotics as the big ugly sisters. And uh, digital twins combined with robotics let you de-risk the physical by learning earlier and faster within virtual worlds. And digital twins, when you couple them with machine learning, they can, you can use them to explore and optimize um, those virtual worlds. But unfortunately, the term digital twin has been completely hijacked. And lots and lots of people talk about digital twins that aren't really digital twins. But for us, what differentiates a true digital twin from other digital models or simulations is the fact that you're conjoining these digital and physical worlds. So let's have a real example. Imagine you wanted to optimize the traffic flow around a city like Oxford, which definitely needs it. Uh, the road network and the traffic on it is your physical twin. And you'd probably put cameras and sensors and on the junctions uh, and collect all the data about the people and bicyclists and, and dogs and everything else moving around. And then you'd feed those data into a digital model or simulation of the traffic network. And then you could use that model to optimize the topology of the road network, maybe for future things you haven't built, or the timing of the traffic lights and things like that. Um, and you could then feed those outcomes back into the physical twin and actually update, if you like, the timing of the real traffic lights. And that's the conjoining of the circle that makes it a digital twin. And, a, and an example of that for us is the digital twin that we have that looks after these swarms of robots. Uh, each of these robots that fly around at about uh, four meters a second, uh, they generate about 5,000 data points a thousand times a second. And um, that's about a gigabyte of data per robot per day, or about four terabytes of data per swarm per day. Uh, and that's just one warehouse. And there's no way that human engineers staring at screens could oversee, let alone optimize, such a complex system in near real time. It's completely beyond human scale. And so what we do is we stream all that data to the cloud, and we build a healthcare system up in the cloud that looks after the uh, swarm by doing predictive maintenance, trying to spot the onset of problems before they become problems. And it's a bit like the, um, what we can do with patient data and wearables and sensors in the home, maybe for humans, where we can do remote medicine, if you like, um, uh, with a similar system. But what's special about a swarm of identical robots is if any of them does get sick or needs a rest or charge of batteries or have a service, it can come off into the pits and then any of the others can take its place. But as well as feeding into that healthcare system, we also feed all that data into our digital twin of the hive. And that optimizes, if you like, the behaviors of, a, of the swarm, and then we update the real parameters of the control system, uh, of the real-time control system uh, that manages the hive. And this is, if you haven't guessed already, is a, vis is a video of that digital twin. And we build simulations of all sorts of parts of our business, like demand forecasting, what people are going to buy, you know, van routing, you know, the routes that our thousands of vans drive each day. And what we're really on a journey is to build an end-to-end -end simulation, if you like, of our whole e-commerce fulfillment and logistics platform. And learning with digital twins is powerful, but it has its limits. It's really quite hard at the moment to simulate more abstract concepts such as public adoption, ethics, and privacy concerns um, in a digital twin. And this is where living labs come in. And unlike technology demonstrators or sand pits, living labs are all about learning by doing. 
in the real world environment, delivering real services to real customers day in, day out. And why that's important is because customers keep you honest. They give you feedback, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and they help drive pace and agility. And uh, the, the living lab provides a physical environment that is representative of the real world, but it's initially more constrained to allow you to learn faster and with less risk. And you can then loosen those constraints over time as your capabilities and confidence grow. And uh, we use Living Labs to let our robots to learn how to pick those 55,000 different products, but also the whole first warehouse in Hatfield was a Living Lab because over its kind of 15 years when it was being rapidly innovated, it's now in a maintenance mode, um, it was delivering millions of customer orders but at the same time, we were ruthlessly inventing new mousetraps, ripping out the old one and putting the new one in whilst it was kind of in flight, uh, which is easy to do, say, but not so easy to do. But the UK needs living labs to accelerate learning towards the future of mobility and smart cities and things like that, complex environments where um, we're not going to do it by theory alone. And we need to learn about how the interplay of different technologies changes to regulatory models, stakeholder management, safety, new business models, public adoption, and many others will all fit together. And these are complex challenges to overcome. And at the moment, I think we believe there's far too much kind of trying to swim the Atlantic by standing around swimming pools. And so we're embarking on turning the Hatfield Business Park, where we're based, into a living lab to explore the intersection of autonomous vehicles, drones, robots, smart infrastructure, and smart services. And we formed a consortium, and we're now uh, in the midst of our final funding application for that. But this living lab would just be the first step in a much bigger vision. Firstly, to turn Hertfordshire into a county-scale living lab, and then to encourage other business parks and counties around the UK, including Oxford, to replicate um, what we've done and what they're doing already in many cases to create a family of these interconnected living labs. Uh, and we believe that then we might seriously move the dial in terms of things like the future of mobility. Um, and we, as a company, operate at this intersection of AI, machine learning, robotics, digital twins, and living labs. We build smart mobile machines which are plugged into the world around them with the Internet of Things that stream their data exhaust to the cloud, and then we use digital twins and living labs to help design and optimize those complex systems. And with these living labs, along the way, I'm going to get to food in a second, um, uh, we, we will evolve and test the frameworks and standards for crowdsourcing digital twins as a step towards assembling these at a national scale. And this all leads to the idea of creating a national digital twin um, of the UK, which is a truly ambitious vision and some might dismiss as unachievable. Um, but there are people as mad as us uh, who believe in this, so the Centre for Digital Built Britain, uh, part of Cambridge, um, and University and uh, the National Infrastructure Commission and others do share this vision. And it's all about how you would uh, crowdsource them and glue them together using kind of common frameworks and whatever. Um, and it's a task that you'll never finish. You're never going to build a national twin because there's always going to be more things and higher levels of fidelity that you might have to model. But the good news is that you don't need to get to the end because each of the digital twins in its own right is useful. But when you start gluing them together, you get combinatorial effects. Um, so, for example, having a digital twin of the UK rail network would be cool and useful for optimizing timetables and minimizing delays and de-risking the impact of maintenance and things like that. But if you then start combining that with digital twins of the road network, airports and seaports, um, now uh, you start to get insights across the whole transportation system. And then you add the digital twin of the energy network and you might work out where you should put all the EV charging points and things like that. So um, I think I've said enough about digital twins. I'm going to stop there. Um, right, let's carry on. Um, so one last bit before we go on to recipes, which is uh, Let's just imagine you were going to erect a building like the Shard. You know, it's a highly complex building with lots of new technologies. How would you go about that? Well, obviously, it's, you know, what you do is you clear the ground, you get a group of builders down to the site, you show them a picture of the building you want, and you say, get stuck in. And uh, now, whenever I say that you know, uh, to a group like you, um, and they don't smile. It's quite worrying because then I sort of think, oh my God, that's how you do think you build the Shah. But anyway, uh, you're smiling, so that's okay. But the, uh, you wouldn't do that. It would be an absolute unmitigated disaster. So what would you do? Well, the first thing you might do is build a digital twin of the building. I certainly would. Um, and, but the other thing you would definitely do is you'd create a set of layered drawings. So architectural, engineering, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, networking, building management, and so on. 
And those buildings oops, um, serve many purposes, things like transforming the high-level vision of the architect into something that can actually be built, helping drive greater collaboration and communication across stakeholders and contractors, enforcing building standards and best practice, managing complexity because you can turn the layers on and off and just see the ones you're interested in. And after the building's been built, uh, uh, it acts as a document of rec they act as a document of record to aid the maintenance. Well, the, the challenge, I think, is that we're not just trying to build a smart building without a digital twin and a set of layered drawings. I believe we're trying to build and operate a smart country without them. So uh, I believe we need a set of layered semantic maps of the UK, including of the food system, to enable people to understand the bigger vision and how the different pieces fit together, to enable people to navigate around the institutions and, and government, which are often impenetrable from those on the outside, to enable people to understand the mesh network of stakeholders, relationships, technologies, and so on, in order to foster better collaboration and faster innovation to enforce standards and interfaces, to enable a diverse population of contributors to crowdsource ideas for completing and improving the maps. And I believe that would even foster a new form of distributed democracy by enabling communities to take ownership of completing their parts of the map, to help people avoid creating the same non-competing technological building blocks, if you like, the common Lego, where the unhealthy diversity at the moment is not uh, going to be good for us, and I'll come back to that. To capture via change control and versioning the historical evolution of the maps as a document of record. And then to provide methods to safely and controllably access and share that information across and within the semantic maps, because I can assure you, if you go and talk to people like GCHQ, as I have about this, they get quite twitchy about what um, this in the wrong hands would do. But anyway, um, the base layers um, would be the kind of geospatial layers. So, you know, environments, buildings, roads, the kind of physical assets, where things live. And that's what organizations like the Geospatial Commission, part of the uh, Cabinet Office and, the, and an Ordnance Survey are focused on building. And then you might have some properly locked down layers for things like the security services, defense, police, and so on. And then as you move up through the layers, you might have layers for institutions such as national government, local government, regulators, NHS, still restricted but visible to more people. Then there might be layers for more general purposes, including fostering collaboration and communication between a technology company such as Ocado. And then as we move up through the layers, we get to more abstract concepts such as relationships, stakeholders, and influences. And this is where we're moving from maps to semantic knowledge graphs. And eventually, we get to layers that might be publicly accessible, where regions, communities, and even individual citizens could decorate. So for example, the highlands and islands of Scotland might want to add rather different information to their part of the map than, say, you know, a city like Oxford. So those are some of the, the, the disruptive ingredients uh, that uh, are important in, in the recipes that we're cooking. But um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about now how we kind of glue those together in terms of how we approach in, uh, innovation. We've always been this kind of strange blend of a technology business, a retailer, and a, and a disruptive innovator. But we've recently now become a platform business uh, too. And it's really that innovation factory which is where the exciting things happen. I'm going to skip a little bit here because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Um, and when you're doing a kind of military campaign, there are those areas you want to capture and occupy with your own forces, the areas where you need to collaborate with your allies in order to make advances, and there's the areas where you need to stay in touch with what's going on with intelligence, but where you're not going to be directly involved, and the areas where you currently occupy, that you currently occupy, which you may need to give up. Well, at Ocado, we like to think about our disruptive landscape, if you like, in a similar kind of way to that campaign. Um, uh, and in terms of how we map things out. So the top right-hand quadrant are the things that are truly differentiating, where we're going to do it ourselves, we're going to do the R&D, we're going to file the patents, we're going to own the intellectual property and monetize it. Then the top left-hand quadrant is still stuff that's very important, but not quite as strategic, where maybe we don't have the skill sets to do it completely ourselves, uh, where we're going to collaborate, we're going to find partners, we're going to do joint ventures, and we're going to share the intellectual property. Bottom left-hand corner is where things are now moving towards commodity, but they're still not, you know, vanilla products won't do it for us. Here we want to work with suppliers, uh, get early access to technologies, but also influence the development pipeline uh, of the products that are being produced. And then the bottom right-hand quadrant is where things have now moved to commodity. They are truly non-differentiating. If we ever built them in the past, we should stop building them, and we should just buy them off the shelf. And our research activities are a bit like sending out scouts to explore that top right-hand quadrant. 
uh, and the patents that we file are a bit like defensive bunkers to hold the land until the main forces arrive. And sticking with the military analogy, our advanced research teams are like special forces. Uh, they are multidisciplinary, uh, they're self-sufficient, they operate with different rules of engagement, they can go behind enemy lines and blow stuff up. Um, and um, once we've mapped our disruptive landscape, the next step is to identify the technologies and competencies that will be required to implement it. And this is a bit like, you know, having a complex kind of Lego model that you want to build. But what you're doing is trying to work out what are all the different shapes of Lego pieces that you'd need to build it and how many of each of those pieces you'll need uh, to construct it. And one way to view our history is that really over the last 18 years, we've been on this kind of crazy shopping trip of innovation assets, so data, intellectual property, know-how, technologies and competences. And we happen to have used online grocery as the vehicle for that trip. And of that, the competencies are the really valuable part because although they take time to acquire, they're a source of competitive advantage. They're not easily displaced. And once you've acquired them, they can be used all over the places, uh, all over the place. And some of our key core competencies are things like simulation, AI, machine learning, optimization, motion control, understanding how things move, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, robotics, and disruptive innovation itself. And um, the reality is that those innovation assets know almost nothing about groceries because they don't need to. Um, because groceries, in our terms, are just atoms with certain properties. They're actually quite troublesome atoms because they have to be kept to the right temperature um, and, you know, they'll crush one another if you pack them in the wrong order and they have short shelf life and things like that. Um, so what that means is if you can do, if you can manage food atoms, you can actually manage a bunch of other atoms too. And, um, and that's what we're now engaged with. And um, I used to run a car technology that does the heavy lifting in terms of building our platforms. But in 18, uh, April 18, 2018, I handed that over and to go off to create a new division called the Office of the CTO, or OCTO. And our remit is very much around research, advanced research, IP strategy, relationships with government, lots going on there at the moment, relationships with universities, whether it be collaborative research or internship programs or Horizon 2020 or whatever it is, stuff with schools and digital literacy, technological future in the business, but it's also about pursuing these spin-out applications. And here's a slide from a recent results announcement that shows some of the spin-out applications that we're working on. And on here you can see things like vertical farming, which I'm about to get to, car parking, baggage handling, parcel sortation, container ports, rail yards, and many others. Um, and what they have in common is this concept of atoms. And indeed, Ocado's mission, the kind of tagline that you see on our stuff, is changing the way the world shops. But Octo's mission, as it says here, is even more exciting, which is changing the way the world stores, sorts, assembles, moves, and sells atoms. And so we have quite a lot to do. And the first thing we do when we create these spin-outs is to file patents, and the next thing we do is build simulations, which eventually will become digital twins. And here is a very early version of a video for car parking. Uh, I'm afraid it is an early one because the later ones have intellectual property that I can't show you. But you get the idea from this. And these car parks are going to be important within things like smart cities, not just for conventional cars, but for the storing um, ca uh, car sharing and autonomous vehicles, including delivery vehicles of different formats, so that they can be stored, charged, and serviced, and then dispatched on demand close to where they're needed without clogging up our streets. And this design turns out to be more efficient and cheaper and even more environmentally friendly, because you don't have to have all the nasty concrete, than conventional car parks. And, uh, as you can see from that list, most of these applications are quite far from online grocery, but some of them do have synergies with our core business. And, and, and the, the, the obvious one there is vertical farming. Um, and I'm going to skip over that one. So let's talk about vertical farming. OK. Um, so people have been trying to do this kind of non-conventional farming for a while. You know, the Aztecs, you know, Pan Am, um, and uh, greenhouses have been around for a while. Uh, and, but they all relied on free solar energy. Um, and of course, people have played with doing vertical farms for certain kind of high value cash crops for a while now. Um, and indeed, this is quite an interesting one, uh, which we ourselves may get to. But, um, but the fact is, we're not going to feed the world by you know, sticking farms on top of rooftops in Manhattan, where they, people started doing this, or even on the side of you know, buildings. I'm afraid that's just not going to move the dial. So we need to find other ways to do this. So obviously there is a revolution going on in terms of LED lighting uh, at the moment in terms of the cost of that coming down rapidly. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, why vertical farming is interesting 
is because it will help us address food security issues. It will enable, uh, we, um, it allows to be, breed plants for taste rather than for pest or drought resistance. Um, it, it means that you can pick the plants when they're ripe rather than trying to ripen them in transport. Um, by having multiple cycles, you know, there is certainly no concept of seasonality. Uh, you, you can use about 5% of the water that you can with commercial agriculture. Um, significantly lower food miles if you build them closer to the customer, which we'll get to. Um, better than organic in terms of food quality. Um, demand matched, which means that you only can grow and bring to, if you like, fruition uh, what is actually going to be consumed. Um, and, and those go back to those kind of customer trends that I, I mentioned, or desires that I mentioned earlier. No soil erosion, pesticides, or water pollution. Uh, growing, opt um, op um, in fact, growing these systems using machine learning to optimize them um, end to end. And finally, very, very dense and highly automated. And if you ask yourself, where do you find plenty of sun to generate cheap electricity, a shortage of water, because of course these are closed systems, which is why you can use so much less water, and cheap land that nobody wants to use for anything else. And of course the answer is in deserts. And now increasingly people are starting to build large vertical farms in deserts, as well as things like large algae production facilities. But the fact is the world is not going to be fed using leafy greens and basil, which is kind of like most of the stuff that people grow at the moment in vertical farms. So we need new varieties that to be bred that are suitable for vertical farms. Uh, we need these also for things like exploring not just uh, food that we eat, but food as medicine. So nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals and everything that we haven't yet exploited, if you like, plants for. Um, we want to explore the whole area of personalization of food. If, you, if we can grow you a, a, um, a lycopene-enhanced tomato, um, you might be able to take, eat that rather than taking statins if you've got a particular heart condition. So lots of exciting things there. Plant-based proteins. Uh, growing insects, aquaculture, and potentially other living things in these dense systems. Uh, exploring new ways to convert green electricity, if you like, into calories, which is the whole purpose for this. But obviously, vertical farming is only going to be one part of this new food ecosystem. So we have to find all those other ways of doing protein and algae and things like that. Um, now, if you remember that grid that I showed you earlier, uh, hold that in your mind, uh, because I'm going to give you four ingredients here, or a few ingredients. Uh, but now imagine that each of those um, little cells, each of those um, boxes, was its own separate experiment. Okay? And uh, imagine that each one is orchestrated, uh, as all that whole family of, of experiments is orchestrated and monitored using machine learning and AI. And, um, and that inside those uh, little boxes, you're doing experiments for if you like, for creating new kinds of digital growth recipes. Uh, but you're also doing accelerated breeding of new varieties, because we have to produce lots of varieties that are suitable for vertical farming, but you know, uh, which don't necessarily look like the varieties do in the fields at the moment. And then using, maybe even one day, you know, digital twins of the plants themselves to help steer where we might do the experiments. We're a little bit way off that at the moment generating different growing environments uh, on demand, including potentially ones that don't exist yet. So whether it be you know, new environments that will exist because of climate change, or if you're Elon Musk, maybe working out how you're going to do terraforming on Mars by creating that kind of condition. And, and much more exciting than any of that, just imagine you could recreate the conditions that, were, that led to a particular uh, variety or vintage of, um, of wine. Now you could do vintage wine as a service. I mean, how good would that be? But anyway, um, and now I want to talk about when you start putting all these ingredients together, which is part of our vision. So the first ingredient is the idea of the vertical farm uh, of different sizes. You know, they, these, like our warehouses come in different sizes, these vertical farms will be at different sizes. Some will be near the customer, some will be further apart. If you then glue that onto one of our kind of uh, distribution and logistics machines that is very, very good at getting the stuff to the customer, that's, that's cool. Um, uh, then if you add a uh, third ingredient, which is food preparation, but using robotics. So think about dark kitchens here. And a company we invested in last year called Karakuri is involved in that. It's building robotics, but very much focused on, on food preparation, uh, whether it be things like, you know, chilled food, personalized chilled food, or recipe boxes, or um, salads, or whatever. And then the last ingredient is one called Ocado Zoom. So um, we launched this uh, last year. 
Uh, if you live in West London at the moment, it's the only one that exists at the moment, uh, uh, but we're going to photocopy it soon. Uh, it, um, you could order um, from fi a range of 15,000 products, bigger than really anybody else who's doing kind of immediacy at the moment, uh, and we advertise that you can get it in one hour from clicking on your phone app to actually arriving on your kitchen table, but it's typically sub half an hour or even sub 20 minutes. And indeed, that company, Karakuri, when they were doing their launch um, event, uh, they told me uh, it got to 10.30 at night and they ran out of vodka and nibbles. I mean, that is a proper first world problem. And they, they, um, they decided, oh, we're in West London, let's use Ocado Zoom. So they started ordering vodka and nibbles and they came within 20 minutes and that was great. And I think they then just carried on ordering vodka and nibbles until they didn't really know what they were doing. But anyway, the, um, but anyway so that's all very exciting. So that's the idea. If you put all that together, a vertical farm next to a warehouse but close to the customer, um, now you've got, an, and with automated kind of robotics to prepare the food, you've now got an extraordinary integrated food machine. And you can go from plant to kitchen table in perhaps two hours. And unless you live on a farm, that is freshness that you will never know, as well as less food miles and water and all the other benefits. I went through it again. But you know what? We need to think way bigger than this, because um, the transformational impact um, that technologies like the ones I've talked about, robotics, AI, quantum computing, are going to have on our lives is going to be completely nonlinear. It's going to, uh, and that means that our preparation for that world needs to be nonlinear too. But one of the challenges I feel we really struggle with as individuals, as institutions, as a country, and as a species is, as we were talking with Chris before we started, there is insufficient, really big, really long term, really disruptive thinking going on. And um, we're not going to solve problems like climate change within a five-year democratic term. And to support more of that big, long-term disruptive thinking, we're going to need to structure ourselves to do it. We're going to need to create processes and tools to support it. We're going to need to teach our children how to do it. And we're going to have to nurture it when it happens. But we're also going to need a compelling vision to drive it, a holistic vision for what a truly smart, equitable, prosperous, and sustainable UK might look like. And here, I believe that Government has a role not to create that vision, open brackets, God forbid, close brackets, but rather to convene a diverse group of stakeholders to do that, putting up the Christmas tree for others to decorate, so to speak. Because to, to successfully compete with some much bigger countries around the world, we're going to have to find ways to play the innovation game smarter, more selectively, and with greater leverage. Or as I like to often put it, we're going to have to find the asymmetric warfare model of innovation. And if you've ever sat, as I have, in um, government department waiting areas and watched some of those videos that are playing you know, on the screens, um, you would absolutely believe that everything is great, nothing is broken, and that the UK can conquer the world. Well, as a country, I think we've really got to stop drinking so much of our own Kool-Aid. We have to get real about what is in the UK's top right-hand quadrant, like the one I showed you earlier, um, and what is the elemental Lego required to implement it. And then we need to invest heavily in creating all those Lego pieces, whether they be technologies, institutions, skills, research programs, competencies, or whatever. Uh, because we do not need diversity. When I was a child, there were five different shaped Lego pieces. Now you go into a toy store and you buy a fairy castle thing, it's got 50 different Lego shapes, you know, and it's great for building fairy castles, and it's beautifully pink, but actually, when you combine that with all the other Terminator sets and everything, the number of Lego pieces just explodes, and we just can't afford that as a country. And the amazing thing is, wherever I go, um, uh, around, I find the same recurring patterns um, uh, at play, whether it be in the AI world, in extreme environments, the Future Flight Program, the National Food Strategy, and others. And like fractals, um, these, these are recurring patterns. So things like the need for synthetic environments to speed up innovation and optimize complex systems of systems, the need for common standards to be able to crowdsource the, those, those models together and build those digital twins I was talking about, the need for more sophisticated models for sharing assets, such as data and digital twins. So including the passports um, uh, to do that, because free data, open data, is great, but it's a massive um, subset, if you like, of the data. And you won't get companies like Ocado and others sharing their data unless they know who it's going to be shared for and for what purposes so that it won't be weaponized against them. And if it's not just needed for data, it's needed for gluing together digital twins and other assets too. 
the need for living labs to accelerate learning across lots of different problem domains, the need for better maps to understand these complex landscapes, because wherever you go, you find people don't have maps of their areas, and they don't really understand how their world fits together, let alone how their world fits within all the other worlds. Um, uh, and we need to work out, as I said already, what that elemental Lego is that's needed to implement the, the, the visions associated with those landscapes. And we need to think beyond the current challenges and focus on what I would say is the first derivative for the mathematicians in the room. It's not, for instance, just about where, how we deploy robots to solve problems. It's about how do we create robots that can build and repair robots? How can we build robots that can build factories that build robots? And so on. So because that's what creates scalability by design. And that's central to what we do. But I think it's absolutely key for the UK, too. Um, I'm conscious I'm eating into question time. So um, I'm, but I'm going to give you one more, two more big ideas. Okay, so, right. So I want to leave you with three big ideas, actually. The first is, uh, you know, buy, buy two, get one free. Um, so uh, we are a retailer, aren't we? So anyway, the, the first idea is about how do we move atoms around the UK in more efficient, um, sustainable, and scalable ways. And the, the fact is that many supply chains are fragmented and inefficient, including the last mile, uh, with everybody kind of doing their own thing, with very little coordination and collaboration. And this is true about freight in general, but it's definitely true about uh, food, which is an extreme case. And there's a little point about transforming food production if we can't get that food to where it's going to be processed, stored, sold, and ultimately consumed. So it's time for another analogy here. For those of you in the room who use public cloud, and I'm afraid all of you do, if you don't know it, because your phones do, you know, the advantages of public cloud over on-premise infrastructure are numerous, and they include things like faster innovation, funded by using that income from lots of customers to drive your R&D, common standards and interfaces, shared middleware that no company could afford to build for itself, higher levels of security, resilience, and robustness the ability for users to buy capacity on demand, which means they can scale it up and scale it down as they need, and that leads to faster experimentation and greater scalability. <coughs> Enabling users to start focusing on where they add real value, rather than building and operating their own infrastructure. And so to drive greater sustainability and efficiency into our supply chains, what about creating a public internet of freight for the UK? What would that do? Well. It could provide a common set of data standards, interfaces, governance protocols, metrics, analytics, and SLAs, a common set of smart middleware services, an ecosystem that suppliers, processors, um, delivery firms, um, retailers, and others could connect to in order to provide and receive services and data, operational economies of scale and greater security, resilience, and robustness, improved utilization of scarce resources, whether that be energy, land, time, transportation, network bandwidth, and the rest. Reduce pollution, waste, and congestion. A single point of integration with post-Brexit measures uh, for goods entering and leaving the country. Um, think backstop on steroids there. Um, uh, ability to provide common regulation, quality standards, analytics, and monitoring. Support for new cross-sector and cross-competitor models. If, if a cardo is delivering a pizza to a, a hospital, there might be a bag of plasma they'd like us to pick up and put in our refrigerated van. Well, those are two worlds that will never find each other at the moment because they're completely separated. Whereas if we actually had a system that is managing that as a holistic model, we will find those intersections, and we need to. Um, a high-fidelity simulation or digital twin, of course, of that end-to-end uh, internet of freight to help optimize it and, and, and manage the complexity. And it isn't just about a digital internet of freight, that's where we might start, it's about physical ones too. So things like rapid transit networks for freight, not least to get more stuff off our roads. And here uh, you need to think about things like Hyperloop, which is obviously Elon Musk thing, but for, you know, uh, people, but um, in vacuum. Uh, but um, think about the same thing about tubes underground with freight um, moving stuff around. Um, and how to make better use of our railways and so forth. And the second big idea um, is about catalysts, um, because as the scientists in the room well know, um, you know, catalysts either make reactions occur that won't naturally occur or they speed up other ones. And I believe there are a set of national catalysts that will help the UK work smarter, faster, more efficiently, safer, more sustainably with greater competitive advantage. And what might that list on that, be on that list of national catalysts? Well, a national digital twin and a family of semantic maps of the UK a national network of living labs to accelerate learning across lots of problem domains, a national network of maker labs to balance digital and physical worlds, because the most exciting stuff happens at the intersection of that two, of those two worlds, which is kind of the world that we live in. But it's also to foster the next generation of inventors and tinkerers. Um, but last but not least, I'm going to leave you 
um, with the most important national catalyst of them all, which is education. And I'm mindful of the fact that I'm in a, you know, uh, uh, educational institution um, uh, and that probably what I'm about to say uh, will ruffle some feathers, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, when it comes to the uncertainty that we now face regarding the impact of these disruptive technologies that I've been talking about, one of the very few insurance policies we have for that future world is education. But as an employer, as a father, and indeed as a citizen, I would assert that our current education system is not fit for purpose in terms of preparing the next generation for that smarter, more automated world that they will inherit. I believe it's broken now, but the cracks are just going to open up wide very soon. And this is a very big topic, and I'm, not, I'm just going to skim the top of it uh, um, to finish. But many of the skills and techniques I believe that we're currently teaching our children are going to become as devalued in the years to come as the encyclopedia has been by the World Wide Web. And instead, we need to focus on teaching enduring meta skills, such as learning how to learn, collaboration, creative thinking, problem solving, intersectional thinking, mind mapping, design thinking, goal setting, emotional intelligence, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Because if education is meant to be about preparing the next generation for this smarter, uh, for, sorry, for their future life and instilling a love of learning because it's going to be all about lifelong learning, then I believe we're failing at the moment in terms of the structure and curriculum of our current education system. Because the relentless focus on exams, tests, and the regurgitation of mark schemes is consuming almost all of the educational oxygen, leaving teachers with very little time uh, for spontaneity or for just sharing their love of a subject and, and pursuing the curiosity of their students to see where it might lead. And if we allow education to switch our students off the joy of learning, then we will do them an incalculable disservice. But on the other hand, if we enable our children to leave school having learnt how to learn, full of curiosity, armed with a holistic set of future-proof skills, and with the joy of ongoing learning, then I believe they will be well-equipped for their life ahead. So I believe we need to completely rethink our education system from the ground up, and in so doing, future-proof that underlying curriculum. So um, I'm sure some of you are sitting there politely thinking, an internet of freight, a set of national catalysts, rethink your education system. He's completely nuts. It's definitely time to sell my Ocado shares. Well, maybe I am, but then you know what? You do have to dream big. And I can assure you that many people thought that Google Street View was completely unachievable and mad before it just simply got done. So um, uh, I uh, inadvertently used that government phrase there. Anyway, uh, so I want to finish by setting you a challenge because I believe great leadership is about many things, but it's definitely about inspiring people to do things they had no idea they could achieve. And I believe we need to inspire our citizens with a great vision on, and bigger thinking in order to power our nation to do even more amazing things, including transforming our food system and including solving climate change and the rest. So as leaders, technologists, employees, parents and citizens, I believe we need to challenge ourselves to think really big, really long-term and really disruptively about our future, and then to challenge our businesses, institutions, and governments to do the same. Thank you very much indeed.